with Josh Altria. Uh, and like Brian said, this is SOLIDWORKS Redneck Workarounds, uh, creative solutions to everyday challenges. This is a presentation that myself and Adrian Tranjoy have uh, presented numerous times at SOLIDWORKS World. Typically, it's about a 60-minute presentation, so we had to knock some things down, and we're going to tear through this thing as quickly as possible today and show you as many uh, good things, tips, and tricks that we can here in the amount of time that we have today. So, so getting right into it here today, um, basic agenda here, show you a problem, show you a solution to the problem. We're going to repeat this until we run out of time. Uh, we throw some fun things in there here and there as well. Uh, like our, you know, redneck U-Haul uh, truck here. Uh, what do you do with the old U-Haul and a bunch of square body Chevy parts? You make that and you take it to 7-Eleven, that's for sure. So, um, usually run a little disclaimer here. You know, basically says we're not responsible for anything that happens uh, during the course of this presentation or thereafter. And we'll go ahead and speed through that. So, our first problem that we have here is uh, sheet metal as a weldment. So we have a custom weldment that is to be made out of sheet metal, and we need to be able to flatten each section so that we can fold it up here. We want to design it in that final uh, stage here, so how do we get to that? Um, pretty simple solution here. Step one, we create a surface sweep to start off, and that gives us our outside shape and profile there. Um, you can then use the SOLIDWORKS Convert to Sheet Metal uh, functionality here. And you grab each segment and you turn each of those into, into sheet metal. Uh, you work your way around the part. Uh, when it's all said and done, you delete or you hide the original surface body. And then you can turn around and flatten each segment. Or you can turn around and create configurations so that you can see each uh, individual section there or you can save off the solid bodies. The nice thing about this, each item is listed as a, um, is still listed as a cut list item. You get all the sheet metal properties, all the bounding box area, everything that you need to turn around and manufacture this part. Um, and once again, saved inside of one single part file. It's a nice way, especially if you have to go back and do any changes later on. You know, when you lose a headlight, many ways to get it done. I, I want to be the guy who climbs out to turn that on while you're driving. So, um, next part that we have here is um, turning a 3D part into a 3D sketch. So we need to create a complex 3D uh, sketch for a weldment. And if you're not that well versed in 3D sketching, what is an easy way that we can get around that? This one here, we got a little video that kind of goes along with it. So what we do is we create our 3D model. We then create a 3D sketch, and we use SOLIDWORKS to select all the edges of our model. And once we select all those edges of our model, we'll go ahead and uh, convert those entities. Exit out of that sketch. We delete our body, turn around and show our sketch. And there's our wireframe model. We didn't have to do this with a 3D sketch at all. And we can turn around and then drop in all of our pipe segments to finish that guy out. So pretty simple way to do it. Nice thing about that, we can roll back, make changes to that solid body, update the 3D sketch, update our weldment real easily at that point. So, all right. This one, this actually happened at our office. That was in front of our office. The, the uh, pallet was too big for one truck, so they thought two trucks were going to do it. They stopped once they realized how much the uh, 3D printer inside was actually valued at before they dropped that to the ground. So um, these days, everybody works with um, imported parts. And some of those imported parts are drawn great. Other ones, we get the situation that we, that we have here. Um, the part that you imported has the wrong orientation, um, and the origin is not where you want it makes it difficult for doing any kind of um, assemblies or any other work with that file. So what do we do with that? Um, solution is pretty simple for this. You can see uh, by the highlighted face there, we created a, a new sketch on, uh, on a flat face that we decided to dictate our new orientation. That's what that sketch is going to do for us. We then turn around and insert a coordinate system 
Uh, this is found in the reference geometry drop down, by the way. And you want to make sure you set your origin and axes. Um, I always tell people make sure your, your positive X, positive Y, and Z are going in the direction that you want. And once we get that done, we can then turn around and export that file out. Um, we're setting the output when we do so, you need to go into the options uh, when you export this out. Just as an IGIS or step, parasol, any of those is going to be fine. Uh, when you go into the options, you'll get that output coordinate system selection there. Make sure you choose your new one, and then you turn around and you round trip that file by bringing it or re-importing it back into SOLIDWORKS. That will give you it in the proper orientation, just the way that you want it. So, if I find the HVAC guy who did that one, that's uh, going to be problems there. So, uh, next one that we have here, adding a carriage return to a custom property value. So, um, you know, the problem that we have here, your company name or other uh, custom property will not fit into your title block. Now, we all know SOLIDWORKS has the ability to uh, take that text box there, and we can drag it and change it, and it will auto-wrap things um, to, to fit that box. But what if the item that we have doesn't conform to what we're looking for, or we always want to be set up a specific way, such as our company name? How do we go about that? <clears throat> Inside of a blank notepad or text document, all you have to do is create just a carriage return. You start up a new document, you hit enter one time. Uh, select all by using control A, um, and a copy of that, control C, and now it's going to copy that carriage return symbol uh, to your clipboard at that point. Next step that we do, we go back into our part file and we open up the custom properties. And we pick where in that value or text expression we want to have that carriage return. And we paste that item in there, control V. Um, and then the one thing to note with this, it won't look like anything has happened when you paste this information in until you click OK. So only paste this once, otherwise you're going to end up with multiple carriage returns in there. Step three, check out the results. Open the file properties back up. You can see that new value expression. If I clicked inside of that box, it would expand it out. Um, and or you can check the drawing to see the results, and we can see the results there on the far right-hand side image. So nice way to be able to put that in there and have it locked in um, always for that uh, text box there. So I would not climb on that ladder, that's for sure. Uh, I don't know what I'm worried about more than the ratchet strap giving out or the stack of uh, two by fours there, but it uh, doesn't look good either way. So our next item that we have here is uh, configurable sketch text. So the problem that uh, we're running into here, you have text that you want cut into a part or that is different for each configuration. In this case here, uh, a label with a, with a part number on it. It's a common problem that people run into. And we want all this stored inside of one file. So how do we do this? Um, the first thing that we do is we create a configuration-specific custom property. A lot of people forget that this one is out here. Um, when you go to uh, create custom properties, everybody by default jumps to that middle tab custom that you just saw a few minutes ago in that last solution we were working on. We want to go all the way to the end and we go to configuration-specific. We create our um, property in there. Uh, this one's just called number, and we put its value in there. What do we do after that? We go in, we create your sketch text, and we link it to the new custom property that we have out there. You can just you can see the syntax out there of dollar sign uh, PRP and then number. Now, two things that I want to remind people of in here: um, having an alignment line will help control the placement of the text if we always want this to be centered. Um, on a line or you always want a certain distance in from the edge, that alignment line will, uh, will help us out with that. Also, creating a design table is going to aid in controlling the text. If you saw in that first image there, I had a design table with all my configurations listed out there. 
made it really easy for being able to control those. And that way you don't have to go into file properties and uh, toggle those around. You can do that all inside of the design table, which is all controlled inside of Excel. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Too many problems to list out here. So, but this thing's supported, so I guess that's all that matters. All right. Um, next one that we're going to look at here is uh, incremental sheet metal belt bending. You have a complex sheet metal part that you need to form incrementally. Uh, we're going to skip over the rusted out fender, and this is going to be our actual part that we're going to uh, flatten out. You can see it's got some pretty complex uh, forms and bends to it. And we're obviously going to need to hit this in multiple steps in order to get this uh, to form properly. So how do we do this? <laughs> what we do, we start off by using sketches in the split line tool. And we are able to break the faces where we want our bends to be. So you can see the image on the left shows what, um, what SOLIDWORKS has in there for the bends. Uh, the image on the right shows what we want our bends to be, showing those incremental steps as to where we want that uh, part to be formed. We also add a bridge of material between the two ears. Um, it's shown in blue there. And this simply allows those two items to be flattened together, uh, and then you can go back and cut that little bridge out later on. So once we do all of this, what we end up doing is we go into SOLIDWORKS and we use the Convert to Sheet Metal tool, uh, something that we used uh, previously in, uh, in some of our examples before. It's kind of one of those uh, tools that people sometimes forget about. And what's nice, it has the ability to collect all the bends. And this will now get a part that has incremental bends inside of it. And the result, when it's all said and done, we can flatten it out. You can see in that far right corner there where we had broken up that face in the previous image, you can see all those uh, bend center lines there. Um, you can see how in the left-hand side of that image, you have the ability to suppress each of those flattens and show exactly how that part is bent and the steps that it goes through in order to uh, generate that file. So pretty neat way of, uh, of being able to control that part. All right. It's a small bathroom, that's all I got to say. So uh, next one that we have here, the dreaded failed to save document error. This is one that people have seen time and time again. So these are kind of our top 10 ways of going about um, in working through a fail to save document error. First thing is, does save all work? In the file drop down menu, grabs uh, the part and all the assembly, or uh, the assembly and all the subparts. Next thing, um, try to use control Q. The forced regeneration, a little bit stronger than just a standard rebuild that will sometimes get you out of it or show you any errors that may be happening inside your file. Do you have any configurations? If you do have configurations, cycle through some of those, maybe the largest and the smallest, just to see if there is something going on with one of those configurations that maybe there's an error in there preventing us from saving it. So, um, did you just edit a part? So if you did just edit the part, um, how uh, we want to make sure that we uh, exit out of that or open up that uh, individual part file and check to see uh, whether or not that one um, is got the problem with it. So, uh, next one that we have here, uh, turning off all the add-ins. We want to turn off all the add-ins, see if one of those is maybe causing uh, a little bit of a hiccup in, in our uh, file there. Kind of like our Goodwill couch here, uh, resave the assembly to a new file with a new location and see what happens to it. Uh, if it was on a network drive, save it to the desktop, give it a new name, uh, see if there's something maybe in the network or the naming convention that is holding that thing up. Um, SOLIDWORKS Pack and Go. Um, you can save to a new zip 
uh, folder or, or to a new zip file or to a new folder, and that will gather up all the parts, uh, assemblies, and drop them into a new location. See if that will act, gather the files up and allow it to be saved that way. Um, we can always insert the part or assembly into a um, into a new assembly. Um, so if you if it was in a single part file, drop it into an assembly. See if it'll save out that way. Um, can you save any of the subparts? Open up the individual part files or individual subassemblies and try and save those out. See what happens with those individual files. Last but not least, we can always resort to SOLIDWORKS backup here. Uh, make sure you turn on the auto recover, check the location that's at, confirm the file is there, and, um, and you have a decent copy of it before you close out and discard any changes, obviously, but um, SOLIDWORKS backup can be a good option there. I do see we have um, <clears throat> a question that came in. This is around about the halfway point, and we're doing pretty decent on time here so far. Um, so what somebody was asking is what's the advantages, disadvantages um, in using the configuration specific property tab as opposed to a design table which comes from Austin. Um, and this is regarding our, our sketch text there and our custom property. Um, Austin, we actually use both of those in conjunction with each other. We use the configuration um, specific property and we use the design table so that way at the design inside of the design table you could actually um, create all the new configurations and that configuration specific custom property you can actually use the design table then to link those two cells together so the names update um, you can use all of the Excel functionality that's out there as well so you can use concatenation and other information from that part file sometimes to be able to uh, generate that information. We also do a presentation um, on design tables. That one was done um, earlier this month as part of the design innovation series. It's also one that uh, we do at SolidWorks World, so we can point in the right direction of that one um, as well at the end of the presentation here. So, a good question. So, all right. Keep things rolling here. Um, if this, if your mechanic does this to your car, uh, you, you got some issues there. So, <clears throat> moving on, uh, chamfering surfaces. We want to put a chamfer between two surfaces, but there is no option to do so. If we look at the surfaces uh, toolbar here, you will see there is a fillet option in here. If you look at your standard features toolbar. There's a fillet with a drop-down option that gives you fillet or chamfer. So we can't create a chamfer at the surface level here. So what do we do to work our way around this one here? Solution one is the fillet method is what we're going to call this. And we create a surface fillet to the same size that we would like our chamfer created. And that's going to turn around and it's going to put our fillet between those two surfaces. We then turn around and we delete the face that was created by the fillet. When we delete that face, it now leaves a gap between our two surfaces. We turn around, we add a surface loss to fill the gap. So you can see that we use the two edges um, that were left in the opening there to control it. If we wanted to, we could get fancy and put some guide curves in there. This one worked out pretty good just the way it was. So that's one way of doing it. The option two is the thicken method. We create a surface and we thicken that surface, whatever uh, value that we need to there. In your new solid, we add a chamfer in there. So you can see we add that chamfer to the inside corner. We then create a surface offset with a distance of zero. That's a possible, that's a thing that you can do there. You can put in an actual value of zero at that point. And then we turn around and we delete the solid body and we end up with our part there. One of these is about four steps. The other is, uh, is three to get the job done. Um, really, it's about the complexity of the feature and showing you that there's multiple ways to do this. Um, that's probably one of the biggest takeaways from this presentation is 
not necessarily all of the items that we're showing you, but there's different ways of doing things inside of SolidWorks. And sometimes you got to get just a little bit creative and use the tools in a somewhat unconventional way to get the job done. All right. I always say that it's going to be Adrian, our uh, co-presenter, when, uh, when he retires. But, uh, you know. All right. Next thing that we got here is our shell that won't shell. So the problem is we're trying to add a shell uh, feature, but we get an error with this. This particular problem, you can see in the lower right corner, this comes from uh, Ed Eaton of the DeMonte Group, one of our customers who we've worked with for a long time here. So when we go to create the shell, we get this rebuild error. And you can see in the lower right corner of that image that it's highlighting um, one edge for us, something about a face being too small. So how do we work around this? What we do, we add a fillet to remove the problem area. And you can see the radius that, they, that we put in here, it's small, 0 .001. So really uh, an in, a very small value that's in there. We then add our shell. We can see that that value carries over onto the inside of the wall thickness there. And you can either leave that uh, radius in the corner if it's not uh, of importance to you, but maybe in the case of this plastic part, it is. So we can uh, delete that face and do a patch. SolidWorks will run that back into a 90-degree uh, corner or a sharp corner for us. And we got our part with the shell inside of it. So pretty neat way to, uh, to create that. Uh, this is uh, seasonal hot and cold storage, I guess, for your cabinets, depending on what season it is. Uh, it dictates what you get there. So um, services, services, more services. We've all seen this. We get um, an import uh, customer file, whatever it might be, and it's made up of hundreds or thousands of services. You go to import diagnostics, and it gives you this laundry list of bad faces, gaps between faces. All those blue lines that we're seeing in there is some kind of small gap between each of the surfaces that are out there. So we know if we hit attempt to heal all at this point, it's going to take a long time. So how do we get around that? What we do, we export that file as another neutral file format. I personally, I've had best success uh, using IGES file formats. Uh, you may want to try two or three of these just to see which one works out best for you. Uh, Parasolid, Step, all of those are, are great options to use. Then you want to import the file you just exported making sure to check the import options. There are options in here for trying to form solids, uh, knitting surfaces, uh, doing entity checks uh, on this. So it gives us some good options as we go in and import this. I usually start with the default and then uh, make some adjustments from there. There's also an uh, automatically run import diagnostics and all of that what we end up with for our end result is a file that has far fewer surfaces and possibly just one solid body. In the case of our part here, this one worked out pretty good. Um, our file had 541 surfaces. Um, we round tripped it like that, and we came back as an imported single solid body with no errors. So not all of them turn out that cleanly, but uh, it gives you a lot more to work with at that point if you only have to go in and clean up a few faces by the time it's all said and done. So neat way to, uh, to be able to do that. All right. See, the radius, they're not set out there so they can fit the Christmas tree up in the rafters a lot, a lot easier, I think, is what the, uh, what the real goal of that was. So, all right. Next item that we have here in the list, and we'll get close to wrapping up here in the next few minutes. Um, how big are my parts? You have a mold or other multi-body part. You want to know the sizes for purchasing and manufacturing. Unfortunately, they do not work in measuring things in length of beers, so we got to come up with a better way of doing it. What we can do, we can make our part into a weldment. Any part um, can be turned into a weldment. So we start off with having 225 solid bodies in this part, 
file here. And if we turn it into a Wellman, it turns those solid bodies into cut list items. When we have it in there as cut list items, we can turn around and we can create a bounding box um, for each of those items. So you right click on each cut list item, you tell it to create a bounding box. This gives you the overall size of that item, but it also gives you volume and material as well. So now we can put in all of our properties for each of those if we need to do anything, any material that was in there, they're all out there all of our cut list items, it even groups together the ones that were the same size for us as well. So a nice, neat way to be able to uh, clean up that multi-body part in this case here. So, all right, probably the last one that we get to here before we jump into questions. Uh, this is another one that comes from uh, Ed Eaton. Uh, he calls this one an atomic bomb fillet. Um, and we have a complex corner that needs fillet. So um, when we look at this, uh, we got two radiuses there, left and right, and those are the two radiuses that we want. We want those to come together in a nice, clean blend. So how do we, how do we end up creating this? So what we do is we add a dam to remove the problem area. The problem is where those two radiuses meet right now, you can see it wouldn't come together cleanly. So each one works individually. Together they don't work that well. So what we do, we add a dam to remove that problem area, then add in each of the fillets, uh, the inside and outside radius is there. The next thing we do, we go back to that delete phase command um, to complete that complex corner. We tell it to do instead of delete and patch, we tell it to do a delete and fill with a tangent fill. And you can see the results on the right hand side there. It does a nice clean transition between those two items there and gives us a nice tight corner that we're looking for. So a lot more, a uh, lot better at that point. So this guy needs to go to the hardware store. You can buy those colors in a lot shorter, shorter lines there. So um, a couple other items that are out here, I'm just going to kind of skip through and, uh, and move on towards the end here. Um, we have uh, ability to come in here, uh, flattening out complex sheet metal parts utilizing some 3D sketches to be able to do that. Um, looking at ways to do easy toolbar modification. You got all these different toolbars inside SOLIDWORKS. How do we clean them up and customize it? Uh, Alt key is one great option that we can use to remove or move items from one to the other. Um, pretty uh, neat way of being able to do that. What I'm going to do, we're going to go ahead and start to wrap this up. Um, we will leave some time here at the end for questions. If you're looking for a full copy of this and any other SOLIDWORKS World presentations that we have done in the past, uh, typically we do uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 presentations at SOLIDWORKS World every year. Um, you can go to that website there. That will take you to those. Uh, if you change that year number at the end, it will take you to our previous year presentations as well. I also encourage you to head out to uh, the CATI blog. Uh, that can be found on the CATI website. Uh, we are publishing a bunch of articles, probably close to 100 this year, on all the new What's New features inside of SOLIDWORKS. Uh, you'll be able to download the videos or view the videos, like Brian has said, uh, from this and the other uh, presentations that we're doing for the Design Innovation Month. Really a lot of great content out on our out on our site there. So once again, I appreciate everybody taking the time today to come out. And I don't see any new questions coming in at this point. So once again, I thank you all for taking the time. If there is anything that we can do for you, uh, feel free to reach up, out to us at any point, uh, call the support line, anything like that. We are always here to help you guys out and appreciate uh, you guys taking time out of the day to uh, hang out and listen to us. Thanks again and have a great day.